friendly. All right, hi everybody. Thank you for attending the pre-AGM presentation um, with Border City Athletics Club's Woman Can Summit panel. Um, this panel today is gonna include Kelsey Bockwell and Dr. Krista Chandler. Kelsey will be providing a summary of the presentation of the Women Can Seminar, including importance of nutrition, gender and differences, female coaching and racial topics. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Women Can Summit series happened a couple weeks ago and there was a really big reaction, um, great reaction from some of our community members. Kelsey is an NCAA All-American, a youth sports All-Canadian, a silver medalist from the Pan Am Junior Championships and was a finalist at the 2010 World Championships. She was a six time outdoor provincial championship champion in the 400 hurdles, excuse me. Kelsey attended the University of Miami where she amongst other accomplishments helped to lead the women's four by four team to a sixth place finish at the 2015 NCAA championship. She later went on to attend the University of Windsor, Windsor and has represented Team Canada on numerous occasions. Kelsey was heavily involved in planning and organizing the Border City Athletics Club's Women Can Summit Series, and she's here today to give a summary of that, like I said. Dr. Krista Chandler will be speaking about the mental health aspects of sport and what was discussed at the Women Can Seminar, and also add in some extra insight for coaches dealing with COVID challenges and athletes right now as requested by individuals in the past meetings. Dr. Krista Chandler has been a faculty member at the University of Windsor since 1999. She teaches at both the undergraduate and graduate levels in the area of sport and exercise psychology. As a certified instructor in fitness in the fitness industry, excuse me, Dr. Chandler has skillfully bridged the gap between theoretical and applied practices of sport and exercise psychology. Dr. Chandler has published articles in a variety of scholarly journals, including the Sports Psychologist, European, European Journal of Sports Sciences, Exercise and Sports Science Review, and the Journal of Applied Psych Sports Psychology. In addition to her research, Dr. Chandler works with athletes of all ages, levels, and sport in helping them achieve their personal performance goals, working extensively with both able-bodied athletes and athletes with disability. And Dr. Chandler also works with athletes with disabilities on a national level. So we just wanna thank both of you in advance for coming today and providing these presentations. And without further ado, I'll pass it off to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much for those warm welcome. I would just like to add to that, that Krista has been working with our Border City Athletic Club for a number of years. She does at least one seminar for us, for our kids and for our parents, um, just talking about kind of the stuff that she'll go over today. And then we've obviously added on to that. But so I wanna thank her again for coming on with me today and for also helping out our club um, every year. So just like Emily said, I'll be kind of going through some of the um, topics that were covered in the Women Empowering Women, um, Women's Can Summit series that Border City put on. So in this seminar, we had Olympic medalists, world champions, world-class leaders in the medical field and elite US and Canadian coaches. So just as a little summary, these are the panelists of coaches that we had. Um, like I said, Canadian and American who have all been successful in their respective um, teams. And we had head coaches and assistant coaches, um, all female to try to get the female perspective. And that was in our first session. Our second session, we had um, Dr. Krista, just like we said before, and she's joining us today. And then a bunch of other um, very high level um, female doctors, nutritionists, um, mental performance specialist. And then we also had Stefu Bernard, who graced us with his presence, even though he was the only male and on our panelists, um, because he coaches for the WNBA and has a very successful program there. So we wanted to see his perspective of being a male, specifically a black male working with um, women in sport. So to start it off, um, I just want to obviously thank the, all the people that had joined us for that and also thank our moderators and our guest speaker, which was Melissa Bishop and Perdita Felician was our moderators for our two panels. And then a special guest was Mia Ali. And just to start off, their topics were talking about parenting and specifically being a mother and still competing in sport. Mia has two young children. And as most of you know, Melissa, she has one young little girl, Corinne, and Perdita also has um, one child. So she took her perspective of after being retired and being a parent. And so now um, 
they sp spoke about those topics. So some of the topics that they spoke about was not, um, not guilt shaming yourself, not mom shaming yourself. Obviously we know as coaches and athletes and officials and et cetera, how demanding being an athlete can be and the traveling that you have to do, not only just as a coach and um, a world-class um, medical professional, but specifically as uh, an athlete and how much you train. So the advice given was not to mom shame, this is your job, you have to travel for your job, let yourself have those um, opportunities and just have a good support system so that you don't have to worry about who's taking care of your child or what's happening with your child. You know that um, Mia said that she would, she sometimes leaves her children with her mom or Melissa had said the same thing. Sometimes she leaves it with her husband, OC. And so just a good support system really helps um, be mentally focused just on the sport and not so much about being the mother and splitting the time and incrementalizing those two situations. So the next topic that we discovered, or that we not discovered, that we talked about, we discussed was nutrition. So two of our panelists um, were talking about how important nutrition is specifically in the female athlete. And all of these topics are specifically for the female athlete, not that obviously things do not happen in the same way with male athletes, but specifically we're doing our women's can. So we wanted to specifically talk about female athletes. So we talked about on the female athlete nutrition in how much do we, is too much eating and how much is not enough eating. Specifically with female athletes, um, body image is a factor during puberty and during just growing up. And so nutrition becomes a, a more specific um, topic as they start to grow up because of these body image issues. And so as coaches, and I know a lot of your coaches are volunteers, there has to be the information about what proper nutrition is for a female athlete, how much protein that each athlete is supposed to get, which is different than just the regular population. Specifically, um, athletes need to, are said to consume uh, 1.2 to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So again, it's very specific specific for each individual athlete, male and female. Um, but again, with the body image issues that can happen, um, it's very important to know what to talk about. And I know a lot of our us coaches and volunteer coaches and helpers at our track clubs or universities um, also have other jobs. But I think that this is part of, and all of this is part of what needs to be offered in a program so that we can have well-rounded athletes and at the end of the day, happy and healthy athletes to perform well, or just general life happiness and health and health that continues on to adulthood, even after they are no longer in specific sport. So they also talked about um, athletes understanding the importance of the energy output given in sport and then the energy consumed to have that as a balance. So you need to consume as much food as you can to have the right amount of energy output um, in a practice. So when we look at injuries and when injuries occur, obviously first we look at the physiological responses, what happened, why did we get hurt physically, what it is. But then with the um, nutrition topics, we can um, lead ourselves into what's called REDS and REDS is relative energy deficiency in sport. And it refers to the situation in which an athlete has insufficient energy intake relative to the amount of training being undertaken. So they're not eating enough for the exercise that's given. And so some injuries that can come from that um, are stress fractures, um, other injuries um, in the body, there's an increased illnesses that can occur and things of that nature. It can also affect mood. Um, so not to say that getting a stress fracture is um, the cause of REDS. You can get stress fracture, obviously, for a number of reasons. But these are just kind of the sign of signs and symptoms that are picked up specifically with girls. But again, boys can al also get REDS as well. It's just a little bit um, more prevalent in women. And it also is more noticeable in women because one of the specific things that um, can be a telltale 
for uh, energy deficiency is menstrual cycles. And so an athlete could be missing a period which could show a sign of fatigue. Um, we know that obviously birth control can affect if an athlete is getting um, a period or not or a regular period or not because it controls the hormones. But if, a, if an athlete is not on birth control and they're not having periods regularly, that can be a sign and symptom of something more happening in the body, which is kind of like a red flag for us as coaches to um, move forward and kind of ask a little bit more questions. Because also with this, you will see the decrease in performance. And so we kind of see the decrease of performance and then we kind of dig a little bit deeper and dig a little bit deeper to try to find the root cause so that our athlete can be happy and healthy. And so when we talk about um, menstrual cycles, it can also lead us into gender biases. And it can do this because obviously I know that if, as a male coach, it may be uncomfortable to have a talk about menstruation with um, female athletes. And this can change depending on the athlete's age, the culture of the athlete, the personality of the athlete, or the athlete coach relationship. And so I know that this is a very sensitive topic and it needs to be handled in the right way. But open conversation is, is how we handle those things. And if you as a coach are not comfortable in having these specific conversations with athletes, then that's when we reach out and try to find someone that does have the specific um, knowledge about a topic and a specific um, realm. It's research that more okay, women are more comfortable talking, young women are more comfortable in talking with female coaches. But as we know that there is a gap in coach and athlete percentages, whereas if a club or an organization has 50 athletes, maybe they only have one female coach to those 50 athletes. And compared to if there's 50 male athletes, there might be three or four male coaches. So just um, having that one person doesn't have to be a coach, it can be a support staff, it can be a physio, a chiro, or, or something that someone, even a parent that is around a lot, that's a female, maybe those athletes will feel more comfortable talking to them about this sort of topic. Or even as a coach yourself, if you're seeing a decreased performance, you're seeing mood changes, you're seeing all these symptoms, as I talked about before, maybe you go to that support staff and said, can you have a conversation with X athlete and see kind of what's happening with them or ask them if they would feel comfortable talking to you as the coach and then moving forward from that. And then, um, because as we saw, as we know, coaches set the tone for the environment at practice. So if you are an open coach and you um, evaluate yourself and your club with having this person around, if even if you kind of name one person as that person to talk to, I know with my club, um, depending on the day, I will be the only female coach out there. So it's kind of like I'm elected to be that person that if someone has a problem with that kind of thing, or other female issue that I'm the one that goes, I'm the one that the athletes go to, whether male or female, those types of situations. So the next thing that we talked about getting away from um, the nutrition aspect of it is how to balance personal life and coaching. So as you saw, we had a number of elite coaches on our staff. Some of them have children and some of them do not. Some of them have families and some of them do not. So we got a really good balance between who does and who doesn't. And a lot of great conversation was started because of it. So what we found was that basically the support staff in the environment is the number one thing that helps you balance between coaching and having a family. As I said, some of our coaches have children and they have said that if they were the head coach of a program, they had a nice support staff underneath them where the assistant coaches maybe picked up slack if they had to go and take care of their child and vice versa. If there was an assistant coach that had children, the head coach supported them to leave at say four o'clock every day so that they could go pick up their kids at, um, at school. So with that being said, I would just like to everyone to think about the clubs that they're a part of or the clubs in their area and evaluate yourself if you're being 
a person that helps promote women in sport or if you're kind of just passing it by if you're supporting that maybe mother that you have or um even athlete that has children are you allowing them to have kind of a flexible schedule so that they can balance both successfully and not burn out or are you trying to make it more challenging or maybe not even trying to make it more challenging just unaware of the 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 difficulties that the person is having right now. So another um, key thing that we talked about is gender roles, specifically in the medical profession. Obviously, we know that there are um, few female doctors um, in the sports medical field. So just be, bringing awareness to that um, would be very important for your club. There are a number of resources that I can put in the chat afterwards, but one of them specifically is coaches.ca has a lot of resources for coaches, for support staff to go on and find these information that we need, whether it's a nutritionist, a mental performance specialist, a sports psychologist like Krista is, or all of these different resources to try to help our athletes be the best that they can be. There's also um, specific groups um, for each hub. So obviously in Windsor, Essex, Toronto area is the East Hub. And if you contact someone in the East Hub, they will also have support staff, staff outside in the smaller communities that you could also reach out to. So if you reached out to them, they would help you reach out to someone in your community. And everyone is just trying to make um, everyone the healthy and happiest and have the best club in the training environment. So everyone is super helpful. So that was also a resource that was given during our seminar. Our next topic was um, racial biases. So specifically just for athletes to begin with, obviously there's a lot going on in the world right now. And some of our athletes might be struggling with gender identity or just everything that's happening in the world with the Black Lives Matter can um, uh, topics in the movement right now. So just being aware of some of the athletes struggle at this time. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. Maybe they do. But again, coaches determine the environment. So having an open conversation with the athletes about having an open conversation with other athletes and creating a space where information can get out and, and things can be discussed um, in an open manner without any judgment or um, uncomfortability um, would really help the athletes move forward. And Krista will talk about that a little bit more um, with like the COVID situation. So I'll move past that. But just having an open dialogue with coaches and athletes right now, specifically um, with the mental side of what everything that's happening right now. And with that goes the understanding and the empathy towards the athletes. Maybe they are just having an off day and they can't, can't perform as well as they can just because they um, have a lot of outside stress that is now coming into training. Another specific thing that um, Sefu Bernard spoke about specifically was how to protect um, oneself. So as a black coach, female or male, obviously we know that it's um, very difficult in this time. And there's a lot of questions being asked and there's a lot of people now reaching out because this information is out there and they want to either learn about it and try to make things better. But sometimes, and even teaching your, um, your athletes this as well, is how to self-protect, not answering every single person's question when they come at you. Because if you're always teaching someone else and you have this kind of like new job that was added onto you, it can become overwhelming. And that's when we lead to coaches burnout and as well as the kids will be affected by this because if they're always getting questions asked to them, they might start getting overwhelmed by trying to answer all these questions when they themselves are trying to figure it out. So it's very important for coaches, for officials, um, for athletes to learn how to self-protect and be willing to have these conversations with people to, to inform people and be open-minded, but also knowing when it's too much for yourselves and when to step back and ask the person to either go to someone else or to do their own research and then come back and you can have a conversation once they're already well informed. And the last thing was just getting help. With that, it can go with anything. Getting help as a coach, 
nutritionist, getting help with a sports medicine doctor, getting help with other coaches that are in the club to help with the situation, reaching out to yourselves as coaches, to psychologists or healthcare professionals to help you cope with the situations that are going on right now, and just making yourself a better coach so that you can portray yourself as a successful coach, specifically if we're talking a specific female coach, because when we look back at this, the most one of the most important things is mentorship. We need more fem female mentorship in all aspects of coaching, medical professions, athletes, mothers, so that these young girls can see a person in the job that they want to see themselves and then help them get to that point. So that doesn't mean that a male coach can't also affect this change by giving your female coaches more opportunity to get around the gender biases of only coaching males because women can coach males and females. So getting around those, uh, those barriers, giving females opportunities or young females that like myself, where I'm still an athlete, but I'm as coach as well. So I, I got myself into that situation where now I can do both and I can balance both and I can be successful in both. And now the younger generations under me that I coach can see me being an Olympic hopeful, can see me as an educated woman in school, trying to better myself and can see me as a coach. So one day when they grow up, they can say, I had a female coach when I was young. And it was very apparent in our seminar that about probably about 80% of our, our panelists had never been coached by a female in any sport before. So this goes outside of just track and field. This goes into all sports, swimming, basketball, any sport, just giving the opportunities to grow and be better. And so the last thing I wanted to just say was we also had a girls can um, seminar after our women's can seminar. All the proceeds from the women can seminar went to the BIPOC girls in Windsor Essex County and ages 10 to 14. We gave them a free pair of shoes and also ran um, basically a little practice with the girls so they could come out and participate in sport in athletics and get an opportunity to be active. And then the other um, funds also went to sponsoring one young black female student that was attending the University of Windsor in the HK department, the human kinetics department to try to further their education and, um, and support black women. And these are just our sponsors that we um, had for our seminar. So if anyone has any questions, you can either ask me now or Dr. Krista Chandler will now go on to talk about mental health and you can we can have a wrap up question at the end. Um, if there's any specific questions in the group chat, I can answer right now, just let me know. And yeah, that was basically our Women's Can Seminar. I think Jason has a question, Kelsey. Okay. Your mic. You're muted, Jason. Sorry. Hang on. I'm just oh, allowing. Okay. I'm just there allowing people. There we go. I think I can talk now. Um, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed this. Um, one little question with the um, the the point that was made earlier regarding building those social networks and the, I guess the plan and the the, the process around uh, parental support for coaches. Um, are there any templates that are floating around right now, or just general? Um, I would say general. Um, a compilation of experiences. I work in government, so I'm kind of used to the whole um, uh, framework that's been applied to all employees. So you can have kind of an equitable um, maternal and paternal um, uh, benefit that applies to childcare, for instance. And I know that's not really there in, in the coaching space or in the sports space right now. Um, are there templates or experiences or some models that are out there right now that kind of um, um, explain where it's worked really well, maybe in some other jurisdictions, maybe European or elsewhere, where uh, coaching and parenting have kind of run synonymously and they've kind of built a community or a community of support around that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of examples that we might be able to see or ones that have been communicated that seem to have worked that might be good examples. 
Um, but um, I'm really curious to see where this might be kind of emerging, because I know this is one of the biggest barriers to to women continuing on in sport. And I know personally of some examples where that's been a big friction point in at least one large university environment where, you know, it just the, the whole the whole event itself has caused a lot of problems for those people who go off on that leave and come back in that transition, et cetera. Yeah, so again, I don't know of specific um, things that are out right now for programs, but um, there are like more in le leadership research, there are specific things that are being done for women coaches specifically, I can speak of. Um, one of our panelists, Dana Boone, has um, one child and she specifically put into her contract that her child travels with her for meets, um, for recruiting, or basically whatever she wants. Like whenever she travels, the child travels with her. So there are situations where things are getting better. And there are situations where some universities have put into place basically a, a quota, I guess. Um, not sure if that's good or bad. It depends on the situation, obviously, of a quota of having a female um, as part of not even just their coaching staff, but of above them, AD, um, and etc. So there are things that are going that are being done in those types of things. But I think it's really just um, with these conversations that are being had, people are more aware of situations that are being mm -hmm. had, specifically in minority people right now. But also with women in sport, because women in sport is a minority right now. And so yeah. with these conversations being had, more people are being aware of them. And then it's almost like a self check. Like, am I mm -hmm. being beneficial or am I being detrimental to these women? And then you kind of move on from there. And um, for lack of a better term, there's trying to break the barrier of this like glass wall, which is created versus a glass ceiling and trying to mm -hmm. break out because minority groups and people of, or people of women, women and people of color are having a hard time moving up because you need to move laterally in a career in different departments to then move up into a CEO position or et cetera. But women are being blocked by this glass wall. So by breaking those barriers down, female leaders will be able to get into these positions better. So I don't think that in every organization or every community is there a specific like guidelines or rules for it. But I think that we're getting towards those things because people are just being more aware, doing the self check and then saying, am I hiring this female because they're the best for the job or am I going to hire X, Y, and Z for a different situation? Does that answer your question? I think so. And and okay. I think if there, if it's not already there, because I apologize, I didn't attend the session. I don't want to drag my question out too long. Um, <laughs> is, there, is there some form of a scorecard in place right now to kind of look at institutions and how they might be accommodating uh, parental leave benefits or just uh, in tandem uh, coaching and parenting accommodations? So with the parenting and coaching, obviously we know at the grassroots level, a lot of parents obviously volunteer and Krista can probably talk about this a little bit more than I can because she is also a parent of a um, young girl who does sport. Um, but I am not aware of any specific thing that talks about the two in, in, in like a written document that talks about parenting and coaching. Obviously we know um, as just myself as an athlete and seeing as a coach, um, parents do have a very large effect on athletes. And one of the seminars that Krista did actually for our club was part of that to try to get our parents aware of the pressures that they put on our children. Um, again, I think that personally, I think that I've seen very successful athletes be coached by their parents and I've seen the vice versa happen. So not that I know that there's a guideline, but again, it's just, um, there's more information being told about even that relationship in general, how parents should act towards children, that it's just one of those things where you get it out and then parents question themselves, how am I, how am I coaching? How, how do I separate the two? How do I compartmentalize you, my daughter, or you, my athlete? That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Also, I'm not sure the specifics on it, um, but of when it will be released, I don't think that we figured it out completely. Probably maybe you can jump in on this. I'm not sure if you know, but our seminar will be released to the public um, later. I'm not, again, not sure when, but if you did want to watch it, it will be released online at a later date. 
Thanks, Kelsey. And we will have another question period after Krista speaks as well. Okay. Um, so if we have any more questions that we want to clarify, if there's something that she covers in her presentation, we'll open the floor as well after that. Perfect. Okay. Can everyone see my slides okay here? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, uh, it's certainly nice to see everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, as Emily said, and as Kelsey said, my name is Krista Chandler, and I've been with uh, a researcher and a professor with the University of Windsor since 1999. And uh, I have my own consulting business as well that I do on the side where I do work with performers, predominantly athletes, but we do see many other performers, um, you know, just to give you some context, you know, musicians, for instance, uh, people who are applying to firefighting who perhaps are having difficulty passing the physical exam because of stress. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Ontario Power Generation with candidates who are going through the nuclear power program. So um, the skills that I teach to athletes really are, are general enough that they can be taught to any performance domain. So um, I, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you and really hope to leave some time at the end today to, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I, uh, most of my research focuses on the applied aspect of, of mental skills. So looking at particular athletes, it tends to be the, the subjects that I, that I research most often and, and a lot of youth in particular. And by that, I mean seven all the way up to kind of 18 years of age, although I do do adults as well. And uh, I've been fortunate enough, as Emily said at the outset, to be able to work with some uh, pretty amazing athletes over the years and traveled to Beijing with a with the team back for those and did did the staging for the uh, for the London Olympics as well. So had an opportunity to work with lots of athletes over the years and certainly gain lots of experience uh, from the athletes themselves. Oftentimes the mental skills that I teach to athletes are the ones that we know based on research tend to be the most successful, but there are times where athletes are teaching me skills that they're using that, you know, perhaps has never been researched and never been published in any of the academic journals, which I read. So it's been a real, um, you know, a, a real give and take relationship with the athletes where I've learned equally as much from them. So it's been a fantastic opportunity for me as well. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, I, I do have uh, a little bit of experience with track and field. Um, certainly, my I, I always say I peaked way too early as a, as a track and field athlete. I still hold the uh, long jump junior girls PEI record. And I'm not going to tell you when in the 80s that record was. It will tell you how old I am, but uh, I can't believe that still stands today. And unfortunately, I didn't get much better after that junior high year. So um, that, that's, my, uh, that's my little bit of experience with track and field. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with, as Kelsey said, the Border City Club. Uh, I also have worked many, many years ever since I arrived at the University of Windsor. And of course, um, Dennis, who just passed away, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Dennis, was a big advocate of mental training. And when I moved to the University of Windsor in 99, he was very open to having a mental skills uh, consultant work with the team. And, and from that time forward, be it myself or one of my PhD students has always worked with, uh, with the varsity team. So very fortunate to have that experience as well. So um, yeah, today I just wanna to talk to you about some of the strategies, perhaps that we as coaches, as parents, uh, athletes, what they can do as well. So I'll move through. I'm actually just going to turn off my, there we go. Okay, so as human beings, we have three basic psychological needs. And these needs are regardless of race, of gender, of ethnicity, of age. They're all these psychological skills that all of us are, are trying to attain. And that is autonomy, which just means having a sense of control. When we lose that sense of control, that's when we start to feel that anxiety or those nerves. We also have a need for competency, meaning we need to feel good at at least something in our lives. Okay, we all need to feel good at something. For athletes, it may be their athletic prowess. For academics, it may be, you know, their academics. As a mom, it may be my abilities as a mother or as a caring sister. So we have that need for autonomy or control. We have that need for competency to be good at something. And we also have that need for relatedness. We don't live in vacuums. We're very social beings by nature. And as a result of COVID, 
you know, we've been impacted on all three of these psychological needs. That last one in particular, that need to belong, to be around other people, to be around our teammates, to be with our coaches, as coaches, to be with our athletes. And so I'm going to come back to these three psychological needs, but I just want you to keep them in the back of your mind as we move forward through these slides. So athletes are known for their determination and their resilience, but as a result of the pandemic, their hard work and their commitment are placed into question. You know, they have questions like, will my season even go ahead? Is my qualification going to stand or remain valid for next year? Will I even make the team next year? What should I do in the meantime if my events, you know, have been canceled or haven't even been rescheduled? And how do I fill my day that's typically filled by going to practices and, and you know, getting out and being with my teammates and, and my social uh, aspect with my team? And these uncertainties we see not just in elite level athletes, as was alluded to in the, in the panel that we had a couple of weeks ago, but we also see this in youth athletes and amateur athletes as well. We know that for athletes, structure and routine and the support that we get for our teammates are instrumental to athletes. And with gyms closing, with pools, training facilities on shorter hours or closing, um, this may not be possible. So as a result of these uncertainties and these many changes that seem to be changing just ever so rapidly, this can take a real toll on the athlete's mental health. We see things like decrease in motivation, an increase in anxiety or nervousness if we don't want to put that clinical term on it. Uh, we certainly see interrupted or perhaps um, compromised sleep. We also know that the appetite can be decreased or potentially even an increase in appetite because uh, people are just sitting around not doing much anymore. This idea of increased rumination, uh, isolation, which is a big one, and frustration. And these are, are all negative emotions as a result of the pandemic or that are just emphasized and escalated as a result of the pandemic. So despite not knowing some of the answers or most of the, those answers to the questions that I noted above, many athletes have really been resilient and have continued to move forward despite the, um, the, the epidemic. Um, some athletes have recognized, okay, where do I need to improve in my skills? And how can I develop those skills? I may not be in that um, norm uh, of practice that I know it, but what can I do to, to work on those skills? And it may not even be a physical skill. It may be a mental skill. Athletes may say, you know what, I'm taking the time when I'm not physically at practice as much as I would normally be, and I'm going to work on those mental skills. Because we know those mental skills improve with practice. Just like physical skills, we don't work on them. We're not going to become better at them. We also know that athletes, and we saw it all, we see it on Twitter, we see it on Instagram, all over social media, the creativity in athletes' workouts have just been astounding to me and what people have been able to, uh, to do in order to accommodate not being able to train like they normally would. We also know that this uh, pandemic has, has really um, forced people to be flexible. Uh, we know that these restrictions are constantly changing. And so it's really important to maintain flexibility and recognize, you know what, the goals that I set for training next week or this month may be thwarted because of the more and more restrictions that are being placed upon us. And so we need to be aware that the athletes need to be flexible because of all these changes that are happening. Um, you know, these circumstances maybe have allowed for athletes to reflect, to reevaluate, to revise, to reform plans, which is fantastic. But most of all, it's really uh, forced athletes to be resilient. And resiliency is defined as that capability to cope with setbacks or adversities or obstacles. And sometimes when we're working with young athletes in particular, they really don't have the opportunities to be tested in ways that perhaps older athletes or just adults in general have been tested as a result of kind of the more life experiences that we've had and as a result, the more obstacles that we've had to endure. But the one thing that's unique about athletes is that they're tested on a daily basis in their training. You know, oftentimes they don't meet the goals that they set for themselves or they're dealing with a, an injury or they're dealing with a setback in their training. So despite perhaps young athletes not having the same experiences as older athletes or adults, we still know that athletes, regardless of their age, 
are constantly being um, being you know stopped with these obstacles that be it small or large that they need to overcome. And like a muscle that needs to be strengthened, without these challenges that we have in our lives, our resilience can never be exercised or never be strengthened as well. So trying to get athletes to recognize that you know, it is something that's a huge obstacle in their lives right now. It's completely out of their control, but we can teach them resiliency and to learn to overcome those, uh, those obstacles and keep moving forward. So what can athletes do? So we'll touch first on what athletes can do, and then we'll touch on what perhaps coaches and parents can do. Um, we certainly know that setting daily goals is uh, important for, for several reasons. Um, and it's important to recognize that we set daily goals, not just for our sport, but our everyday life as well. Without even thinking about it, we set, set these daily goals. But what's important to remember is that athletes need to follow that SMARTS principle, or we as just individuals, if we're setting these daily goals, need to fill, uh, follow the SMART principle. And I always add an S at the end of it, and I'll tell you why, but I'm sure most of you have heard of this before. S stands for specific. So I do this with my daughter's hockey team. Um, I'm, I work with my daughter's hockey team. And, uh, you know, every day I say to the athletes, you got to be ready with your daily practice goal because the coaches may ask you today, they may not. But if they ask you what your daily goal is for practice, you've got to have an answer for them. And oftentimes kids will be very general in their goals and they'll say things like, well, I just want to skate my hardest or I just want to try, try my hardest out there. And although that's a great start, the way as coaches that we can get to that specificity of that goal is to keep asking how. Okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work harder. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to give it 100% at every drill at practice. Okay, how are you going to do that? Keep asking how as a coach until you can't ask it anymore. That is really the most integral part of the SMART goal setting principles is that specificity. M stands for measurable. Can we measure it? We wanna be able to go back at the end of practice and say, did I accomplish that goal or did I not? And sometimes in track, for instance, things are easily measured. It may be a, a time that you want to attain. Uh, it may be a number of sets that you want to obtain. But sometimes it's not so easily measurable. Like maybe I want to say, you know what, I just want to be more positive with my teammates today. How are you going to measure that? So I'll say to athletes, well, you know what, let's put it on a scale from one to 10. If you say right now your support for your teammates is about a six, how much you provide support when you're at training to those athletes. At the end of today, maybe you can aim to be a seven or maybe you can aim to be an eight. So you use this kind of sliding scale of one to 10 or one to 100, whatever you want it to be, and try to get athletes to measure their goals that way. A stands for achievable. During COVID, I like to make the A adjustable. I think it's a more um, appropriate A for the times in which we're living right now. Because things are changing all the time, uh, restrictions are, are being lifted and then they're being imposed upon us again. It's important that athletes recognize that the goals that they set have to have some flexibility to them. They need to be adjustable should the context um, uh, call for that. R is just, is it realistic? Really, this doesn't seem to be uh, 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 one of the goal setting principles that's um, entirely violated with an adult athlete. We tend to see this most with young athletes where you see a young athlete saying, I'm gonna be in the Olympics and you know, maybe they've never made it outside of their region. And so, you know, we need to set more realistic goals. And then of course the last one is time-based. And in this instance, when we're talking about daily practice goals that time is really easy. It should just be, did you attain that goal at practice today? Okay, so we know that goal setting works because it improves motivation. And this is key right now. So many athletes are coming to me and saying, Krista, how do I even get motivated for training when I don't even know when my next competition is going to be? And that's a real, that, that's a real concern and it's a valid concern. Uh, it's one over which the athlete has no control other than continue to go to training and put in their best effort. And ways to do that is through daily goal setting. We also know that it can provide focus. Um, you know, as Kelsey alluded to earlier, uh, there's just so many things going on right now in the world that athletes oftentimes are being pulled in multiple directions. You know, we know from our student athlete population at the university, they're trying to manage online learning, which many of them have never done. 
you know, they're trying to manage perhaps living at home when they've always lived away. Uh, they're trying to manage, you know, the social isolation. So all of these things, if we set daily practice goals, it increases their focus for the time that they're at that practice. We know also that it can allow for a sense of accomplishment when we have very little um, competitions on the horizon, athletes are motivated by feeling that sense of accomplishment. And when there's no competitions to go to, then as coaches, maybe we do little, you know, inner, inner squad things, or maybe we set those, get athletes to set those daily goals and really reward them um, even verbally for just accomplishing those goals as a sense of accomplishment. And then the last one, and this really taps back into those three psychological, basic psychological needs that we have as humans, and that is it allows for a sense of control. In an otherwise very uncontrollable world that we live in, not knowing so many of the answers surrounding COVID-19, setting daily practice goals is something that I as an athlete can do and I can strive to achieve. It's completely within my control. So what else can athletes do? Well, we can help them develop strong mental skills to manage their emotional responses. One of the earlier slides that I had uh, in today's presentation talked about the negative emotions as a result of COVID, the frustration, the isolation, anger, potentially the rumination. But if we help athletes develop or at least um, highlight some of the mental skills that they can be implementing, it's a great way to be able to manage their emotions. Things like imagery or what's better known as visualization can help. We know that simple deep breathing is extremely effective to manage emotions, especially in the heat of the moment. We also know that journaling or gratitude um, journaling is very important, especially in, in the, you know, the, the, the new norm of which we're living. Uh, daily routines are important. Again, routines like daily goal setting is something over which we have complete control. And when we set routines, it allows for a sense of familiarity. And because it's familiar, then we feel calmness. And so those are all good things that we want in our athletes when they're coming to practice and when they're thinking about their, uh, their training. And then the last one could simply be mindfulness. So really trying to get athletes to think about being in the present and not thinking about what they did have or what season was like last year and how great it was or what's coming up because we can't possibly predict what's to come. Okay, so just going back to those three basic psychological needs here, the uh, autonomy or control as it's also known, the competency or feeling good about something that we, we do and the relatedness or that togetherness that we have because we're social beings. And as I said, as a result of COVID-19, all of these three psychological needs have been impacted. So what can we do to try to increase those psychological needs in athletes? Well, a recent study was done on student athletes. And what they found is that student athletes who received more social support and reported more connected, connectedness, reported better mental health and well-being than those who didn't have that support or didn't feel that connectedness. How can we do that? Zoom meetings. I know a lot of us talk about completely being fatigued online, but student athletes, we're in the midst right now of actually doing a, analyzing a qualitative study that we did with many of our varsity athletes at the University of Windsor and how leadership has evolved during COVID. And it is overwhelming the response that we get from athletes in terms of the importance that those team leaders or the, those teammates have when they reach out to teammates and make them feel connected and make them feel as though they're still part of that team. Uh, we can have Facebook groups. There's a lot of team challenges that have been going on from the comforts of your own home, but just things that make the team feel together and as though they're still a team. Uh, with respect to autonomy, any uncertainty leads to a sense of or a loss of control. So it's important to help athletes recognize what's in their control and what's not in their control. Things that are in their control, okay, those are things like exercising safely, training safely, seeking opportunities for development and growth. What do I want to improve on as an athlete? Maintaining physical distance, um, maintaining social interactions, be it from a distance. Things that are out of our control. When will my track season resume? When will physical restrictions or masks 
restrictions be lifted? When will a vaccine be found? All of these questions are out of our control. And the last one is competency. Again, just helping athletes really focus on what are those daily goals so that they feel a sense of accomplishment. They feel a sense of competency. Okay, let's move now to what can um, coaches or parents do to help. Um, we certainly know that, um, you know, as Kelsey so nicely spoke about it, sport is part of their identity. Okay, it's a big part of who they are. And when they don't have that same type of sport that they're used to, they feel disconnected from their teammates and they may feel that sense of, um, of that loss of identity. And that can certainly lead to negative mental health issues. Um, as parents, as coaches, we can help them manage their emotions, letting them know that negative emotions is a normal response. Being frustrated, being angry, it's normal. But how can we focus on the positives? How can we focus on the things that are, are like gratitude? How can we focus on what we have right now? Recognizing too that this, you know, negative emotions may be amplified in youth simply because they don't have the same life experiences to draw upon. They don't have those same, um, you know, life um, obstacles that have pre been presented to older athletes or older individuals. Um, listen and acknowledge, you know, just be aware asking them, how are you today? Okay, and then listening to the response. So often we say, how are you today, Kelsey? And then we just kind of keep running around the track or we just keep moving because it's something that we say, but we don't really listen to the response. And coaches, you are a huge part of athletes' life, lives. Remember that, stay connected with your athletes, reach out to them, help them plan be it their goals, their routines, especially with young athletes. They really don't know how to set goals properly or they don't know how to develop routines. And oftentimes they need coaches to help them with that or parents to help them with that. And then lastly, get them to remember the why. Okay, this really goes back to why did you engage in sport? You know, and try to get them to focus on that because that's going to be a positive focus as opposed to always focusing on the negative. What else can we do as parents? Well, we can certainly be positive role models. Okay, we can um, respond positively to the ever-changing environment that's out there. We're dealing with it too, uh, parents and coaches, we all are. Learn to manage our own emotions. You know, try to keep cool in front of our kids and our athletes so they, they realize how to cope effectively. Take care of your own health. This was brought up quite extensively in the panel that we did. Um, where coaches and, and physicians all talked about, we can't help other people if our own healths are, in, healths are in jeopardy. So it's important to manage our own health. Remind athletes of the resiliency that they have. They're mentally tough. I mean, that's what makes them athletes and allows them to be successful at the sport is because they have that mental toughness. They have that resiliency. And then lastly, help them seek balance in their lives. You know, um, way back before COVID, sport may have consumed their daily lives. And now sport is not consuming their daily lives, but how we don't want video games, we don't want eating, we don't want television viewing to, to take place of that. So how can we get them to balance um, all the things that are going on in their lives? So I want to leave it open to questions, be it for me or be it for Kelsey happy to address any of them, uh, happy to follow up if after today's session you want to, uh, you have answers that, that just come to mind after, please reach out to me, just Chandler, my last name at uwindsor.ca, and I'd be happy to address them. I'm just going to flip quickly to my resources slide uh, for those of you who are interested. Also with that, if you have any questions um, that aren't covered here, or just about the seminar in general, you can just email coaches at bordercityac.com or go to our website, Border City um, website. And if you email us, we can put you in touch with Krista if you don't get her email today or any of the other panelists that we had and all of them would be more than happy to help if it's a medical professional or if it's a coach or one of our other panelists, everyone would be happy to answer your questions. Go ahead, Robin. I'm not sure if you're talking right now. 
There, <laughs> I okay. just had to. I just had to unmute myself. Um, okay. Kelsey, you, you talked about the the importance of nutrition, and yeah. um, the focus was on on nutrition for for female athletes, but it's important for for males as well. Yeah. Um, and that coaches understand that. How much training do coaches get about nutrition? They are not. Or not, you know, very few would be trained nutritionists. And over the course of um, my involvement, not myself as an athlete, but being around athletics, the number of, frankly, very damaging comments made by coaches yeah. about uh, eating, um, body image, all of that kind of thing. And I just wondered what, what kind of coaching are, are, what kind of training are coaches getting in this regard? So I know... I know of one thing specifically when you go through your coaching courses, you have to take a nutritionist course. I specifically haven't taken that course, so I can't really speak on it. Um, but that's why I mentioned how important it was is that even though every, like most of us that are coaches have other jobs than most of us are volunteers, that it's important to speak about this as well. Because even when we, in the seminar, they also talked about um, like different events, different sports have different risk level of, um, body image and just like these nutritional things because if you're an Olympic weightlifter you have to be a, per a certain weight to perform if you are a thrower you have a different weight or body image than you do a, a sprinter but each one of these um, events and in, in sports all have their own thing and they all affect everyone as an elite sprinter you want to have the six pack abs so that you can get an endorsement from um, some shoe company or something like that. So again, what I will say to that is that I don't think that coaches are specifically trained enough for this because again, nutrition is a very large mm -hmm. topic and you would have to go through a lot of schooling to be a nutritionist or a sport medicine doctor to have this information. But I think that the message is that um, coaches are saying is the most important part, even if they don't have all of the knowledge to have the right things that are being portrayed to our athletes. Just like you're saying, there are specific event groups in athletics specifically is like the distance group. Um, their, their body type is different than a sprinter. So the messages might be different. Um, so I do think that there's more education that needs to go about that, about the framework of what we say to athletes, especially female athletes in these specific sports. Um, but again, if as, as parents, then I would hope that you, if your child comes home and has says, oh, someone says it, or you hear a comment, or you hear two athletes talking about it, then I feel like it's on the parent's ownership to either speak to the coach or bring it up to the governing body, whether it's Ontario or any other province that we have to end that conversation, because that is not a safe environment for athletes to be in. And we want the health of the athlete to be first and foremost, which means that they have safe sport and safe sport is enjoying themselves, having the correct messaging, um, being told the right things and, and, ideally just growing up and having a healthy mindset and a healthy body. And just, just to add into um, Kelsey's comments there with respect to um, coaches and their um, education with nutrition, this is one of the reasons why Athletics Ontario has um, recently been um, putting more and more requirements on coaches from an education perspective and um, ensuring that each club has a certain number of certified coaches that have gone through the club coach training system, which includes topics on nutrition and others. And while they may not be uh, hugely in depth, they are um, enough to get them to understand kind of nuances and be able to help reach out to the experts that may be required to, um, to intervene, et cetera. And the, um, the coach.ca um, ca. Uh, uh, has a lot of nutrition courses and so each coach of themselves can take more education less education to, to, depending on what they want to and what their level of knowledge they want but there is now becoming more and more of a minimum requirement which would include some level of nutrition training as well as, as well as other aspects and this is a, a component that you know we're just getting through 
I think our younger coaches, you know, like Kelsey and others who are just coming in, it's much easier as they, as they understand it. With some of our older coaches, it's more difficult as they feel they're very experienced and they know all there is to know about coaching. Um, they're not even realizing that there are pieces that they're not aware of when it comes to things like nutrition and other things like that. So um, this is an evolution, but um, I've been really excited about the level of engagement of our coaches and how um, they've been getting more educated. And, and Paul, if I can just maybe add to that very quickly, for those of you who probably don't have access to a nutritionist or a dietitian, which many of us don't, reach out to your local college or university. It is amazing to me how many students we have who are PhDs, who are going through a PhD program or registered dietitian, who are looking to volunteer with people just like yourselves who will work with athletes. And uh, we don't use those resources well enough. And I think they're just an untapped market. These people are being you know, mentored by the best people out there and are just looking for experience themselves. And it would be a great way to, um, to perhaps just get them involved for, for minimal to next to nothing because they need that volunteer time. Thanks. That's a great, great suggestion, Krista. In fact, if there are clubs on the call or out there who are looking for support like that, they can connect with Athletics Ontario. We have a lot of connections into that community that we can help to um, connect those folks. You, you may not know any, but we can start the connections for you. Any other and questions? Just, just as um, Jason has put in there, Yes, I think it's, as Paul was saying, it's a generational thing. Um, messages have started to change and need to change. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that's happening right now, even in the world, is that the messaging are, are, are trying to change. And we have some people that are moving along with them and some people are trying to hold back, just like Paul said. So I think that the, the, the best thing that we can do is have seminars like this and talk about it, have an open discussion about these different things. People can say their opinions. And we can kind of change the narrative so things like that don't happen where we put our athletes at detriment because we're saying the wrong things or and sometimes not meaning to, but just it coming off as the wrong thing to say. And again, I would just really advocate for parents. Um, I, I think that specifically with Florida City, like we have great parents that are also involved with us and we should try to promote the healthiest um, club that we can and have the most fun and, and do the most amount of things. And, and part of that is the parents, being parents involved, being parents holding athletes accountable, holding coaches accountable, holding support staff accountable is the best thing to do so that we don't run into a situation where bad things are happening and it's not a safe environment for our, our children. And I say children, and I'm part of the club as an athlete too, but I'm an adult, but I'm going to change that from kids to athletes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kelsey. I, I, I put myself in that, um, in that same boat. I'm a, lot <laughs> older, I'm a lot older than you, but I still consider myself an athlete competing at the master's level. And um, exactly. I, I know we've got others on this call that will feel the same way. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to, we're getting very, um, we're over time, but I'm going to, if there's one more question, out there will take it. Otherwise, we will um, wrap up and um, uh, give everybody a break before we start our AGM at um, formal AGM at 3.30. And just a reminder that the uh, link is a different link. So don't try logging back onto this one or you'll be all, on, all alone um, as there's a new link for the formal AGM that starts at 3.30. So is there any, um, any other questions? If you do want to, um, just message in the chat box and I'll take you off mute. Just as we're waiting for a question, thank you guys for all coming to our seminar. Me and Chris, I really appreciate everyone coming here, having an open mind. We kind of breezed through a lot of information very fast because it was such a short time. So we just tried to like have verbal vomit to try to get all the information out for you guys. So again, if you guys have questions or anything else like that, um, please let us both know. Great. Well, it looks like we're uh, looks like we're good. I really thank you so much, um, um, Kelsey and Krista. We really appreciate you guys coming on. I think this is a really worthwhile um, um, seminar. Um, I know that um, that the recording will will be put up, and I'm sure that we will have a lot more people that will get um, um, some real value out of this. 
as um, we'll post it and we'll share it um, with our folks. So again, thank you so much um, for joining us and we will sign off now. Great, thank, thank you. you everyone. Thank, thank you. Jason, if you have more questions, like I said, you can email Krista directly or coaches at bordercityac.com. And um, it's on our website, bordercityac.com um, is the, on the email in there. So feel free to email. Thank you everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks guys.